I want to welcome everybody. Um, Andy Thomas here, the Chief Marketing Officer at K-Force. And uh, we are just thrilled um, to offer our expertise, meaning all of K-Force's, through our new webinar series. You know, I've been with this firm for over 20 years, and I can tell you, I can't ever remember a more exciting or clearly a more innovative time. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with K-Force, we're a solutions firm that has been in business for almost 60 years now. And to give some context, each year we provide opportunities for more than 30,000 skilled professionals um, each year. And they work with our clients in addressing their greatest opportunities and challenges. Uh, so as we look at why we're all here today, and as you well know, it's quite simply knowledge sharing. Um, in this series, um, you'll hear advice from some of K-Force's top experts really looking to help professionals like you either break into or further advance in, a, in your careers in STEM. And so today's specific webinar focuses on new paths to success in today's job market. And so with that said, you know, we're very lucky to have Adam Lombardi here with us today. Um, Adam is our Senior Director of Delivery Transformation, and you know, within that role, he's continuously improving the way that the firm identifies, but also engages candidates, um, as well as customers. Um, and he does so um, extremely successfully through innovative technology and, and efficient process. Uh, since uh, Adam joined us 12 years ago, he's taken on various roles and led many dynamic and, and productive teams. Um, Adam's clearly passionate about helping people, and it's no coincidence that one of the hallmarks of his teams are very trusting relationships with our customers. But before we start, there's some critical stuff you should know about Adam. Um, Adam holds a degree in sociology from Auburn University, War Eagle. Did I get that right, Adam? War Eagle, you got it right. It's just War Eagle. You don't have to say anything else. <laughs> War Eagle. War Eagle. Um, Adam has also um, traveled quite a bit and gone to music festivals on many, uh, con on many continents. So what you have there is a passion for music as well as a passion for travel. I'd like to explore that a little more. Uh, and I can attest, which you might have just gotten a sample of, um, Adam has perhaps the most infectious and entertaining laugh of anyone that you could ever, ever hope to meet. And I'm sure that will come across today. But uh, formally now, Adam, uh, w welcome to the webcast. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, as Andy was saying, you know, I've been with, um, well, actually, I'll probably start on the music festival first, right? Thank we'll, you. We'll go thank ahead you. and I think that's, that, that might be the most <laughs> impressive part, yes. You know, just, I get very passionate about a lot of things. Um, the 12 years I spent with K-Force, I've gotten very passionate about uh, creating and curating those relationships with candidates, consultants, and, and customers. But in my personal life, music has always been something that's really, you know, driven me. And one thing that I've done over the years is whenever I've had the opportunity, I've taken two weeks off of work, which um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do at a time. And um, there's a group of friends of mine that will we'll kind of put together a nice little package vacation and uh, go find some music in different parts of the world at the same time. So last year, I was fortunate enough to go to Prague to go uh, see three days worth of music there. Um, while going on that trip, turned it into just a, a European vacation, went to Germany, went to Slovenia, and went to a few other places. Um, I've gone to um, all different parts of the country, and uh, probably about my favorite place that I've gone to uh, was Hong Kong uh, for to go see some music. So I turned that into a, a, a small tour of uh, Southeast Asia with Hong Kong and, and the Philippines really being the, the key areas there. But I try to absorb all the culture and learn about as many people as possible throughout all of these journeys as well. And I think that's one thing with music is it's very collaborative. It brings people together. And I think that's something I can really help apply to what I do day to day when it comes to working with people, cr creating relationships and understanding what's important to people. Um, I think a lot of that has, has kind of come from some of these more uh, personal endeavors or, or what I try to do when I'm, I'm not, you know, working the crazy hours during the week. All right, so just just one clarification on the music. You've been very vague. What's the genre of music that you're after uh, through all these travels? So, so most of these are uh, EDM or electronic dance music, but I'm also uh, a big fan of just 
um, you know, kind of older Southern rock, traditional classic rock, Tom Petty's, uh, you know, all time favorite of mine. So it's a pretty diverse, uh, pretty diverse kind of uh, grouping there. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, uh, Absolutely. and in a bit, you're going to be sharing your wisdom for this, but some housekeeping items around this. Um, the last 10 to 15 minutes um, of the session are going to be for questions. So on the right hand side of your screen is a Q&A box. Um, you can type and submit them throughout the presentation. Guys, we're going to do the best that we can to get to everybody's. Uh, please don't be offended if we don't get to yours. Um, also, in, in a couple of days after this, uh, you'll receive an email from KForce um, with a recording of the webcast, a survey for some feedback, and opportunities uh, or a link uh, that will give you the opportunity to sign up for our upcoming webcasts. So that's it. Uh, Adam, I'll turn it over to you for some uh, wisdom sharing on your part. All right. Thank you so much, Andy. All right, everyone. I want to thank you for coming and joining us. And thank you, Andy, for, for the introduction. And, you know, Andy spoke to his, his 20 years or so about how excited he is in this moment um, where, you know, I think my 12 years is I, I haven't really done anything like this either. I think a lot of that has to do with the overall just dynamic shifts that we're seeing in the marketplace today. Um, we are now afforded this opportunity to communicate with a group of individuals in a different way than what we've done previously. Um, you know, the face-to-face the -face meetings for obvious, reading, uh, for obvious reasons have kind of fallen by the wayside. So uh, we're, we're making sure that we can still stay connected and, and we can still provide guidance and value to, to everybody who trusts in us. Uh, from a candidate consultant and, and customer perspective and and hopefully today's session which is the first of three stem sessions is going to uh, be able to provide a lot of uh, positive value to you guys um you know as you as you sit here and listen yep. for the next 30 minutes or so now i'd like to start off by just kind of you know, thinking about something and telling a little bit of a story there's um there's a quote up on the screen i'll get into the details of the quote um but when we were starting to kind of put this together I thought about, you know, what what my overall recruitment life had been like, what was similar to the current COVID times, uh, what was different to the COVID times. And um, right now we're in a we're in a, a transitional phase We're we're in an, we're in a um, not completely unknown scenario, but definitely in a scenario that um, we haven't seen in quite some time. So when I actually joined K-Force, it was in 2008 and there was a feeling of uncertainty out there in the job market. Uh, that's that's relatively similar today. Um, you know, there was concern about what is demand for overall opportunity. There was concern about um, you know if the opportunities are available. Um, you know, how long will it take to fill? Because and when I say fill, how long will it take for for you as a candidate to to be able to get that opportunity? Because a lot of customers seem to be going through uh, extra steps in the process or taking a little bit longer to to to, to um, make their hiring decision. So, you know, I started to relate back to that. And then I said, well, you know, what we're dealing with with COVID right now has some similarities in that regard. Um, but it's also a little bit different because what happened with COVID happened so fast, right? The, the financial crisis and everything that happened with 2008, um, you know, it impacted a lot of people and it happened quickly. But um, there was a little bit more to it than literally overnight. Um, you know, on an overnight basis, our whole world changed, the dynamic changed, entire industries were impacted. So, um, you know, what I wanna be able to focus on today is really, you know, what are in-demand skill areas? What are industries that you could potentially focus on that can really help you out? But before we get to that point, um, I just wanna be able to read this quote to you and let you know kind of how I think it applies to what we're doing today. So just because something doesn't do what you plan it to do doesn't mean that it's useless. And I really think what, what that means is, um, you know, you, or really what it was is that was Edison reflecting on all of his past failures, right? That was Edison prior to getting the light bulb to, to become a huge success. So he was essentially saying that the work that you've done in the past can and should still be applied in the future when you're looking to improve what you're doing. So if we look at where we are today, um, you know, a lot of the work that you've done, whether you've recently graduated, you've studied hard, um, that work is something that you can apply as you move forward. If you're in a career transition and you're potentially evaluating moving into a STEM oriented field, right? What skills and tools can you bring to the table that have added value to you before that can now add value as we move forward? 
Um, and then obviously those that are that are in the industry that are already working as a as a developer or a cloud engineer or somebody in a um, an analytics type of role. Um, you know, how can you continue to leverage just everything you've done previously and apply it to to how we move forward? So really, what this overall session is about is you know when discovering new paths, it's important to remember the quote. Um, you know, think about that as you're going on job interviews. Uh, or one of our future sessions is going to focus purely on uh, presenting yourself appropriately and job interviews and, and creating and curating resumes appropriately. Um, but in this time of COVID, it's very critical to remember um, that what you've done before, you want to make sure that you apply that. Um, it isn't lost on anyone uh, because it is a little bit more difficult out there now than it was a couple of months ago. But I still think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'll definitely show some areas where uh, we're, we're seeing some good uh, hiring successes and hiring rates today. So as we dive deeper into uh, the contents for today's session, it's really important to understand the three main focus items that we will cover um, because it will really help set the stage for what's to come. And the stage being the rest of this series to an extent, but the stage is also indicative of uh, what we're gonna be talking about for the next, you know, next period of time when we're all here together today. So our goal is to help you understand the shifts in the overall employer demand um, first and foremost, right? What was potentially something that was really a, a hot commodity just a few short months ago? Was there particular skills within this STEM space that were, um, you know, really, uh, really almost there was almost a shortage from a customer perspective that that now we've been able to, um, you know, that are now spiking for a particular reason? Or was there something that was so robust and that's now come to a screeching halt? We want to be able to kind of share some of that information for you so you have an understanding about how these how these skills are currently needed and how they fit into the overall landscape. Now, within that, um, there's a, a, a industry component that that needs to be considered. So, what industries are currently leveraging skills within the STEM landscape, skills within the technology world, um, to be able to survive through this overall change in uh, the, the change in times and, and the change in overall industry that we're currently going through right now. And third. I want to try to paint a picture of what the new normal will look like in the workplace. So new normal is probably something that you've heard about a lot on TV. New normal is probably something that you've read a lot about and you, you, you never really know what that is. I'm just going to use new normal as, you know, three months ago, the vast majority of us were going into a workplace every single day. And or we were going to a workplace maybe three or, or four days a week and we had we had a day or two remote. but. The new normal is the overall shift in how business has changed. What does that look like? What does that look like from you as an employee? But then also, what does that look like from you as a candidate in terms of how your skills could be applied to make this new normal more efficient and a, and a better place for everyone? So the next few slides are really going to focus on demand within the STEM world. You know, if you joined us today, uh, you're probably already working in this space or you're thinking about stepping into this space. Maybe it's a career transition. Maybe uh, you just graduated within the last month or so. And, and like myself, when I graduated college in 2008, um, it was one of the worst you know, job markets for, for new grads uh, in, in recent memory. There's still some of that going on today because of hopefully um, a, a short term you know, item that we're overcoming right now. But with that said, there's definitely been a shift. Now, part of why you're in the industry or you're potentially looking to get into the industry, I would imagine has to do with this stat that we have represented here on screen, where since 2008, STEM jobs have increased 14%. Now, you look at that 14% while non-STEM oriented opportunities across the country have only have been growing, but at a much slower rate at around 1.7%. So, um, you know, it's it, it's really interesting that as you look at data or how you or how you or as you hear about things that are potentially on the news, there are some slowdowns even in this STEM landscape in some areas right now, but they're still outpacing other potential industries and there's maybe growing slower than other industries as well. So that's just something for for you to keep in mind. You know, it's because of um, this overall demand within the industry as well that 
you're seeing a lot of large companies offering to reskill their employees. So many of their longstanding employees, somebody that's been within an organization for 15 or 20 years, maybe started in a non-functional component of, of the business, but they also have this amazing um, set of knowledge about the industry, about the company, and they have the, the capabilities to do other things. So there's large enterprises out there that are starting to, to retool other individuals. Those of you that are looking to, you know, still looking at that overall demand, uh, you've probably seen a lot of different boot camps that have become available uh, in the marketplace. I was in the Atlanta market for 10 years prior to moving to Tampa about a year and a half ago. And, you know, we saw a massive demand of folks that knew what the, what the increases were like in these STEM skills, knew that they had capabilities to, to do more with their career. And they started going to these boot camps. And then that was, um, that was where a lot of the gap was being filled with the current needs that were out there. And I still think that that, that holds true today. Now, as you're probably aware, um, the overall demand for STEM is not a completely new concept. k Force actually found that during the 2008 Great Recession, that companies continue to invest in technology versus cutting back on technical funding during an economic, uh, economic crisis for the first time. So that was a massive shift really kind of coming out of 2008 where, you know, technology had previously been considered a fringe or at times it was considered something that that wasn't as core to an overall business. But that 2008, once we got through that 2008, you know, recession, uh, we still saw saw technology oriented careers growing rapidly and we saw people being very you know successful kind of coming out of that. So um, a lot of that was really led to the overall digital transformations that started taking place at that time, where a lot of companies said, we can't, we can't you know, really move away from this transformation effort that we're moving into because this is the way of the future. So that really helped things strong, even in a recession. And I think that we're going to see some of those things hold strong when we're going through COVID right now as well. There will be a shift. There will be a little bit of a lag. But at the end of the day, we're, you know, these STEM-oriented opportunities and careers will still be a little bit stronger or will be a little bit more, um, you know, more available than, than potentially some other industries. So the digital, again, the digital uh, transformations have been the focus for the last decade. And then we're going to continue to talk about how that relates to what the new normal or equivalent is on a, on a future slide here. So really wanted to take a few minutes right now just to look at some overall posting shifts that we've seen. If we look at the left side of this slide, uh, we've got uh, remote development needs, database specialists, support consultants, new hired developers, um, and then solution designers. You know, this is not a full representation of IT technology, STEM oriented uh, skill sets, um, but it is a good depiction of um, letting you guys know that just because it is that STEM landscape, it doesn't mean that the whole industry is completely immune, unfortunately. So, um, you know, we're seeing a little bit of a dip here with development. Uh, we're seeing a dip in some support related individuals as well. But when you look at the, the database specialists that are on this, on this screen, and you think about areas that within the industry that are growing, companies are looking to use and leverage their data in better ways than they have previously. So we're still seeing, even, even with COVID and some uncertainty, a massive spike in job postings that are currently available uh, for, for those that are working within that data space, um, because that's gonna make companies have a better understanding about how to go about and change their business and how to go um, attack their business as well. One thing I do also wanna point out, is, although we're seeing in this development space um, more of the, the remote oriented development needs uh, going down. And we're seeing some of the, the junior development needs kind of staying relatively flat. Prior to getting to COVID, Q1 uh, for, for software development and software engineering was actually thriving. So there was a lot of really good hiring going on. Again, an indicator where companies may be evaluating currently where we are. We need to make sure we invest in certain specific areas that I'll touch on in, a, in, in another slide or two and then uh, we'll be able to hopefully you know, see some trends that I'll be able to pick back up at that time. Again, it's about really understanding um, what roles and what industries are most prevalent and most important uh, within this, this dynamic that we have today.
So when we want to think about, you know, the overall uh, alignment to, you know, driving um, new opportunities for yourself and what does that new landscape look like, it's important to understand the key industries. So, you know, current data has indicated that retail, travel, tourism, food and entertainment industries have been heavily impacted due to COVID. Now, you might think because you watch TV and we hear on the news that it's a lot of frontline workers that are impacted. And those are individuals who have unfortunately uh, potentially lost their jobs or there's been less hiring. And that's absolutely true. But what is also happening is that um, it is more than just the frontline workers, the actual retail workers or the, the, the travel agents associated with these companies. It's the technological components and the system oriented components that are behind the scenes within these industries as well. So K-Force, for example, has uh, several large travel oriented uh, companies that they work with, where we've been very successful finding great people, opportunities um, to find new career roles within, within these industries. But these travel industries, as soon as COVID hit, right, things just kind of came to a screeching halt. And those individuals then unfortunately either lost their job or um, the hiring in those areas slowed down significantly. So then we did our best to help find them other opportunities and we were very successful in other ways. Um, but, but that's just something to be aware of that these industries are, you know, obviously getting impacted greatly. And just, you know, with social distancing is even playing in a role. When things get back a little bit to normal, capacity may be down in these areas. So therefore, hiring behind the scenes on systems, on analytics, um, on overall software development, that, that could be trending down within those groups as well. Now, inversely, there continues to be strong demand in the technology and healthcare verticals. I think that's to be expected. Um, technology is a wide ranging kind of topic, right? Technology is everything from Google and Amazon to you know, your more upstarts like a Zoom that is doing very well right now because of the value that they add within this changing landscape and as the dynamic is overall is shifting across the board. So what we're really seeing from a technology component are organizations who focus on collaboration, organizations that focus on productivity related software as their core product, um, are seeing great success right now, while obviously other sectors are not. So if, you're, if you've been impacted um, or you're having trouble maybe searching within an industry that you're most familiar with, I know I'm in Florida, there's a lot of travel and tourism in Florida, even within that STEM world, right? These other types of organizations are, are, are thriving and hiring at a great deal right now, and they can be able to help you out. Obviously, that the healthcare space is, for, for a lot of different reasons, is, is another area that's, that's actively growing. Um, and that is doing very well at the moment. And a lot of that has to do with healthcare oriented technology due to the overall need and influx of patients and the overall change in care uh, that we're seeing today. Uh, remote doctor's visits, things like that are really on the rise as well. So um, all of that, all of the, the technology associated in those industries and verticals is really what's making things take off. When we think about top tech occupations impacted. Uh, I've already touched on um, the software engineering component, right? Well, what I was looking at earlier was specifically remote developers and then uh, the junior or entry level types of develop development needs. But the last two months have actually seen um, an 8% decrease across the country across all software engineering. Now, a lot of that has to do with where investment is actually going now, which we'll talk about when we get to the second bullet point. But we're also seeing another key IT uh, oriented position, network engineering, that has also seen a, a small decline over the last couple of months. Now, again, I talked about industry alignment previously, um, and I want to bring that back up when we look at the, the retail or the, the travel and leisure industries, because those industries employ a lot of these STEM oriented or STEM skilled resources. So with, with those individuals, um, not being able to get jobs or those industries not hiring, these individuals are having to, to shift and go to other places, which they undoubtedly will find opportunity. There's no doubt about that, but they're still in demand across the country. But a lot of that dip is because a couple of these large, large domestic um, verticals here in the United States have been impacted so heavily, it's impacting the overall skill set and the hiring associated with that overall. Now, with that said, there's been a large demand uh, increase over the last two months within the cybersecurity world. Um, systems engineering as well, and then systems administration. 
Now, when I started thinking about this, um, at first I said, you know, why is cybersecurity, you know, spiking? Cybersecurity has been big for years, right? We've seen a lot of major organizations that you're familiar with out, um, out there, Fortune 500 companies that have data breaches, that people are at risk of, of losing personal information. So cybersecurity has been a large investment area for companies where there's been a lot of hiring over the last few years. But we're seeing an even larger increase now because when we start to now talk about the new normal, we're shifting our entire work group. We're shifting um, everything about um, you know, how we interact with each other. People that were you know, no longer able to take certain information out of the office now have to view personal information at home. So cybersecurity overall is, is growing because there's not a lot of um, you know, standard security protocols in place for this amount of remote work. So this is really ramping up. Uh, companies are trying to protect themselves, make sure their data doesn't get lost, um, and then overall improve and align appropriately for, uh, for the remote uh, types of work opportunities. Now, with that said, the reason why we're seeing systems engineering and systems administration also growing is because these are areas that are, these, these are groups that are working on the overall technical infrastructure of these environments. So K-Force went remote full-time two and a half, three months ago, right? Right when things were starting to happen. Maybe it was a little bit more than three months ago now. And I know immediately, you know, we had some pretty good collaboration tools, but within, you know, the first couple of weeks, we had a massive shift um, in terms of how we were using certain things. Bandwidth changed, uh, infrastructure was stood up, more server power, all, all of those things were put in place because this is what went from some people leveraging these types of tools and went from some people working remote to all of a sudden a few thousand. And these systems engineer and systems administration resources are the ones that allow that to happen, where companies are now really looking to invest more and more in that skill set to make sure their, their, remote, their remote teams can be as efficient and uh, strong as, po as possible. Now, I was talking about a shift to the remote you know, to the remote world. That's that new normal that I was referring to on one of the earlier slides. Um, you know, it's, again, it's, it's a pretty broad term, but for 11 and a half years of my career, um, you know, I, I was in an office every single day. So that, this is definitely a new normal for me and a lot of others that are out there. So that is that overall shift in, um, in, in the remote workforce. So much like the digital transformations prior to COVID, this enablement of the most efficient remote, remote workforce possible is becoming the number one priority of organizations, both large and small. Whether you're a publicly traded company or whether you're a small company that only employs 20 or 30 people, you know, the, the need to be able to have a fully functioning remote workforce is critical. And that applies and relates to a lot of those technologies that I've, that I've worked through. So for these shifts to be successful, Organizations are investing heavily in remote collaboration, productivity, software-oriented technologies, like I mentioned before. So this, this will not only impact the, um, the current employee who uses the tools, right? You know, if you're maybe a Zoom user or Microsoft Teams or Slack or some of these companies, some of these collaboration tools that you weren't very familiar with before, you're having to adjust your day, right? You're now working remote. Um, you're you know, now trying to figure out how, how can I best collaborate while also maybe picking up on a technology for video interviewing, uh, for just video communication with your teams that you've never leveraged before. So this overall remote workforce enablement is a top priority for a company, but it is impacting those that are currently within that workforce as well. So for those of you that are, are struggling with that a little bit, you're, you know, you're not the only ones that are out there. Those of you that are actively looking for opportunities and haven't experienced this yet, it's something just to be aware of because there will be an impact and overall change to how you're going to go about your day because of uh, these new platforms that are rolling out. Now, on the flip side of that, it's also driving demand within that systems engineering space as I, as I referenced previously. So, you know, the, for companies that even had these tools previously, that they didn't have to go out and inquire and purchase them over the last couple of months, they've had to bring people in behind the scenes uh, based upon the, these hiring models that, that you may not even be aware of to make sure everything is, is as efficient as possible because um, the, the remote new normal is, is something that's difficult for us to understand. 
uh, it's difficult for us to adapt to and, and companies are doing everything they can whatever they can to to prioritize this and, and dive in as deeply as possible to make sure that it's efficient for, for everybody involved. Now, the shift is also a concern for the employer perspective. I mentioned some of the security components earlier, um, but overall, there's just a gap in tools. A lot of companies have outdated infrastructure, slow VPN, um, you know, missing tools. They don't have collaborative DevOps oriented environments. So it's, it's exacerbating collaboration challenges. So as you go and navigate the, the paths out there, what tool sets do you have if you haven't been maybe a DevOps engineer previously, right? Because it's a pretty specific item, but there are some coding and scripting skills that are needed within that space. You know, how can you apply those types of technologies or those types of skill sets um, to try to you know, position yourself to, to get that opportunity? Because this is where we're really where we're gonna see a lot of growth. This is where there's a lot of uh, new opportunities on the horizon within the STEM space. Um, and it's not going to go away because the, the longer and deeper we get into this overall um, workplace and remote workplace shift, uh, the more normal that's going to become and the more this infrastructure is going to continue to uh, need to be hardened, in, uh, improved, um, and then made more available for, uh, for those that are leveraging uh, the tools on a day-to-day -day basis, whether internal or for an external customer. And then obviously I mentioned this already too, but uh, impractical security uh, inhibits remote work right now, right? The security standards were mostly designed for those of for those that were working within an office. Um, so there's a large shift right now, redefining policy, redefining governance, um, and then you know obviously investing heavily into different you know, types of tools and technologies that could that could help this as well. So now that you have um, a little bit better understanding of the overall demand within the market, I'd like to touch on a couple uh, last minute items. So nearly three quarters of um, organizations are allocating less than 25% of their technical budget to emerging technology. So if you think about everything that I just said, um, you know, the, the digital transformation for the last decade, decade plus has really been driven by new emerging technologies, right? What have we never had before? Um, edge computing, new APIs, things like that. All of that is still gonna be going on, but most of the new investment right now is, gonna, is really being allocated towards what we've just spent the last 30 minutes or so discussing, right? How can we improve or how can companies improve the overall experience for a, um, a, 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 an employee, how can, you know, how can, how does that then impact the overall search or job availability within an or within the industry, um, which we're seeing within the security space and we're seeing in the systems administration space. And I would imagine we'll see in the development space as that comes back around, but there's a massive, massive shift at a organizational and strategic level uh, to focus more on, um, optimizing what we already have or what is already established versus spending a lot of money right now on, on new cutting edge things that would um, do, you know, impact other areas of the business. Now, lastly, uh, with work remote becoming the new norm, there's an element of um, wanting to focus on business and strategic acumen as well. So I bring that up because we, you always hear in a job search or even in an organization when you're employed, you always hear, uh, you know, I want somebody with good communication skills or it's a culture fit, right? And that's sometimes ambiguous and it's really hard to understand. But as we're working remote, I mean, I've noticed some gaps and some challenges uh, with people that I sat next to every day for, for years. But now when we're in an environment where we're just dialed into a, a Teams call or a Skype call or, um, you know, we're just talking on the phone or we're using a, 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 a text-based, you know, communication platform. Um, you know, that overall ability to make sure you're, you're focused on that communication element and you're focused on improving that aspect of your, um, of your skill set to go along with your technical competencies is really what's going to be most important. Um, you know, or will also be very important through this shift and help you navigate uh, the current climate that's out there today. And that is um, that is everything right now, guys.
would love to be able to answer any other questions about what we discussed or if there's items that are um, you know, other questions that, that weren't touched on that I might be able to try to answer. All right, so are we ready to dive into some questions? Got it, all right. Um, what are the best ways for candidates to get feedback, especially if they were not selected? The company is not openly offering it. And the company is not openly operating it. So it's, that's an interesting question that offering came up. Offering it. Offering it. Um, you know, that's a, we actually did some in preparation for this, uh, we actually polled uh, a lot of uh, online applicants that have, were applying directly to K-Force. And that was one thing that they were saying was that recruiters and internal HR channels are um, sometimes a little bit slower to respond because there is a decrease in some of those areas. So my recommendation would be um, to obviously follow up um, with, a, with a phone call and with an email. But if, you know, the recruiters are becoming more and more aware on social media channels as well. Right. So they're more and more engaged there. If there's other avenues for you to be able to pursue to have an interaction. Um, you know that that that's what I would recommend. Now, unfortunately, what, what's being described is, um, you know, you, there may be an experience that is not ideal. Right. You may be, you know, you've gone through the process and then all of a sudden, you know, nothing's happening. Um, you, you know, some of that has to do with volume to an extent. But I would just recommend, um, you know, even through the process, working with your recruiter, just setting expectations, say, you, you know, I know it's hard to, you know, deliver bad news sometimes. I always say it's that human element, right? You know, people don't like giving bad news. Um, unfortunately, some people, because of that, shy away from, you know, letting somebody know that they're eliminated, whether that's right or wrong. So what you, what you want to be able to do is just say and set expectations. I've seen that work very well, specifically if you're maybe working with a more junior level recruiter. Uh, that you know, setting those expectations about what you're looking for throughout the process can make them a little bit more comfortable sometimes. Excellent. All right, buddy. <clears throat> Next up, and we're going to get right to these and, and kind of fly right through them so we can get to as many as possible. Uh, next, are, are recruiters partnering with visa dependent candidates? They are. They are. So um, at K-Force, I can't speak for all organizations, but at K-Force, we have an entire division that is allocated and specialized specifically in visa, with visa with working with visa dependent candidates. So we actually have a couple different channels where we work with third party vendors directly uh, for candidates who are being sponsored by other organizations. And then we have a very robust channel and pipeline of um, candidates that we sponsor directly and help with opportunities within our with, within our customer base. So that is definitely something that we're seeing a high demand for in the marketplace today. Um, and K-Force is, is very well equipped to be able to help with uh, candidates who are visa, visa dependent. Excellent. All right, next one up for you, Mr. Lombardi. Some people are experiencing challenges due to not having security clearance. Any guidance there? So from a security clearance perspective, um, you know, that's not an area that I've you know, transparently been as focused in over the years within the, the government or the security space. Um, you know, we have a very good uh, group in, in Reston, Virginia that uh, specializes within the security world. Some individuals in that office of ours may be able to help out. We may be able to actually gather some information and then maybe publish something back out in, in, in that regard. Um, you know, I think it would really depend upon though what those challenges are in terms of getting the clearance, right? Or if it's if you're unable to um, go through a certain certification program to gather it, um, if it's just there's a long wait to be able to get those. I, I'm not with it not being a my core area of expertise. I'm not very familiar uh, with unfortunately providing the proper recommendations in that area. Got it. Um, you had mentioned, uh, you know, impractical security measures and, and, you know, there's a rumor that 20% of Zoom traffic goes through servers in China. Um, does that cause any concerns? Um, and this person is saying they've heard that at least one session of Parliament was held in Zoom. Actually, I do know that one is that that's correct. <laughs> um, I, I can't speak specifically for Zoom. Um, I do know that there has been um, some caution or precaution taken with some organizations in terms of which video platforms they would choose or prefer to work with when conducting large scale calls like this or um, on for interviews. 
So my recommendation is if you have concern with that and, and you're working with a recruiter that's wanting to use Zoom or another platform that you may have some concern with, I would recommend and ask if they have another option. Um, chances are more than likely that they probably do have another option that you could communicate on. Excellent. With the increasing needs within clients looking for skills in new slash enhanced technology, we, we get this one a lot, right? What, what are the best places to receive experience and education? Because there is all different types of platforms popping up and, and offerings. Anything you'd recommend? You know, when I was, if we go back to one of the slides where I was talking about retooling and, and what that looks like, um, I was fortunate enough to have great success with individuals uh, who had gone through a few of the boot camps when I was in Atlanta. I know General Assembly is a large one that's on a nationwide level. Uh, there's, there's several others. Um, some organizations are out there actually wanting to find those individuals, right? And, um, you know, it's, it's not a four-year degree. It's uh, less intensive. Um, you know, they're typically 10, 13 week types of programs, but a lot of people or a lot of candidates that I know that have transitioned from, they were more of a, maybe a functional project managers, but wanted to be able to leverage that knowledge of industry and start to be more involved in the code. They took a step back and went into that and were able to transition very well into that more technical aspect of their career. Uh, I've seen a lot of people even out of industry. I've, I've worked with people that were teachers, people that were biologists, uh, people that really were not uh, technically inclined from a, a coding perspective, but they've leveraged those types of boot camps and they've had great success on the back end in terms of placement and finding opportunity and getting to that new career path. Great. I'm just going to keep going rapid fire with you, Adam. What does the project management space look like? So I think project management is, um, you know, it's obviously a, a broad, uh, uh, it, it's a broad area. Um, from our perspective, when we look and we recruit on project management, our customers typically break it down into, into a couple different buckets. They typically look for project managers that have more of a business acumen and financial acumen in some areas where they're maybe more managing financial aspects of a PMO and projects associated. Uh, they typically align then by infrastructure and have an understanding about what how infrastructure projects are run. Um, and then your, your application development oriented projects. And within that, there's then that deeper level of specialization that comes down to, are these more agile based project managers? Are they more traditional waterfall? What's the methodology aligned? So um, what we're seeing a massive trend and move towards is that overall agile based approach uh, across the board. Um, I think you're seeing companies, if we go back to that initial quote at the beginning, is about being nimble, is about being agile. I think we're trying to do that right now. Companies that are more successful through this COVID transition are, are companies that are more aligned to that agile approach. Um, so if I were to look within that project management space for an opportunity, I would try to align myself in those types of areas. Great, I love this question. It seems normal for job applicants to hear nothing after applying for a job. What is K-Force doing to help this situation? Fantastic. Since you've been dedicating the last two years to, to addressing this, you're probably the best guy to speak to it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we, we would refer to that as the black hole, right? That's, that's, that's what people refer that to. Um, and, you know, you hear different things from, you know, there's a software that's matching resumes and you need to be keyword driven and you need to do all of these things. Um, to be able to, you know, I, you know, elevate your your um, to elevate your resume a little bit more because we might put a job posting out there for some skills, and there's a hundred applicants within you know two days, and a hundred you know on paper qualified applicants. So part of that has to be within the industry is that there are a um, and there's a, almost an infinite number of candidates that come in sometimes, but there's a finite number of recruiters that can actually assess candidate and and and. So I think where Andy was referring to, we're really excited about is we're beginning to leverage and um, start to look at kind of outreach techniques that we haven't used before, specifically around um, chatbot oriented technologies. So what that will be able to do is as we're consuming or as we're gathering um, candidates who have applied or we're getting referrals, uh, because that is a huge channel for what we do as well, um, because we're only able to talk to one person at a time, these these chat box will be able to help you know reach out, 
gather engagement, updated resume, specific information as well. So then when we are able to reach out, we can filter through a little bit more based upon engagement with those technologies. Um, but also that way we have more outreach where there's nothing going on whatsoever, which will be able to help us really identify you in future searches much faster. Great. All right. Um, interesting one. What, what should your what should be your approach if a recruiter contacted you for an offer and you haven't heard from him or her after after several emails or phone calls? So you received an offer, and then um, oh, that's yeah. I, I think this this is more along the lines of how do you remain professionally persistent? Yeah, to get the feedback that you need. So I think if we go back to the other question um, earlier and setting expectations. Um, you know, I, I, I think that this is, you obviously can't set expectations every time for every single scenario, but if you have a recruiter that's reached out and then you're trying to then follow up about something, um, I think it's okay to be a little bit more formal and a little bit more direct in some of your communication, right? You never want to lose your professionalism. Um, but I, I think it is fine for you to say, I've reached out three times at this point. I really just need to have an understanding because I need to know if I need to consider pursuing other opportunities or not. And from what I found when I've talked to candidates and you know over my 12 years is that's really the number one question that they have at the end of the day. It's like, I just need to know if I didn't get the opportunity, I understand that I don't always get every opportunity that I interview for, but I just need to know if it's something I'm interested in that I need to seriously be able to still be considering that and weighing that against other opportunities that are out there. So just being direct and letting them know that you know you're in a point where from a, a career decision or from a being able to provide to your, op, your for your family um you you just need to be able to have some kind of feedback to understand which direction you need to be able to go so you can prioritize things appropriately great got a few more coming in um candidates with a lot of it experience um trying to move to the cybersecurity industry you know what are the job roles they should really be seeking out so there's a lot of application security types of roles. So within cybersecurity, it's pretty broad, right? Um, because that's a bucket, just like software development is a bucket. So you know, within within cybersecurity, you've got policy, right, where you're writing and creating the credentials for what the security parameters should look like. You've got infrastructure security. You have cloud security, and then you've got more application oriented security. So within the application oriented security space, there's also uh, penetration testing and intrusion vulnerability assessments where your ability to understand what code looks like uh, is actually very relevant to those types of security uh, roles because you you know what good code and what bad code looks like or where code that might have, um, there might be more risk in terms of how code is being created or how it is stored. Um, you know, that, those are the areas within cybersecurity that I think would be most relevant and where you'd have an easier time transitioning. Excellent. Similar, as a candidate making a slight shift in their career from visual to UX design, do you have any thoughts on how to get, how not to get pigeonholed into a skill set? How not to get pigeonholed to a skill set. If you're, so it's a couple ways to answer this. In your current role, um, if you're looking to make that transition, you want to be vocal with your leadership about that. So if you've been working in more of that visual capacity, but you want to add more experience to how you're incorporating your design or you want to be working with different groups and that happens to be more on the experience side of the house, um, you need to be vocal about that, right? Because if you're good at what you do, you're going to get continued to be tasked and leveraged for those items that you're really good at. So nobody may know that you're actually looking to make that transition. So once you've had that communication, you know, there's an element of, um, you know, you need to probably be a little bit more open when that time arrives to say, hey, we want to be able to lean on you, or maybe it's even more of a junior level responsibility. Uh, you want to be able to be open to, to transition and type into those types of roles. I can speak, you know, I haven't, I haven't gone from visual design to UX design, right? That's, that's not my, my role. But the opportunity that I'm in today and what had me bring move to Tampa really came from that open communication with my leadership about looking for that next step and what I wanted to do. So I think if it's, you know, if it's within recruiting, if it's within engineering, if it's within design, if it's within, you know, you're a teacher, that open collaborative communication is really what's going to help you be able to navigate um, a different direction. 
versus just kind of moving down one linear path. Excellent. Excellent. Interesting. Since moving into leadership roles, my technical skills have waned over the years. Do you have any advice for STEM leaders in the market with respect to skills or certification to focus on to increase their marketability and effectiveness? So marketability for a new role, I would imagine, where you want to, um, if I'm interpreting that appropriately, you want to be more relevant um, for in your next job search to, to validate that you have, still have some technical capabilities. Um, Correct. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different, um, you know, programs that are out there. There's Khan Academy, there's, um, you know, Linda, which is now um, something that LinkedIn acquired where they have uh, a, additional training um there's certification programs that you could go through um you know that that's my recommendation um to be able to validate and be able to speak to that uh, where you can just sign up online for a lot of those courses now there's those are going to cost something there might actually be some there might actually be a, a physical return in, in the form of some kind of online certification from that but you know i've talked to so many developers or so many people that transition that rely on youtube and YouTube has literally opened doors for them uh, from diving into technologies that they already work with, but it's a, a new version, one of the new Angular version became available, right? When we went from five to six, what changed? And you know, they just immersed themselves in, in those online tutorials. And I've also talked to leaders who have done a lot of those same things to, to stay more relevant within, um, with working within their teams. Great, so here's our last one. Um, what happens to the universe of applicants that you've accumulated? Do you search your existing pool before posting a new job, or are they ignored? Meaning, and the ignored is clarified, meaning they must reapply to each and every job posting. Really, really good question. And um, they're, they're definitely not lost and they're definitely not ignored. So as I mentioned a moment ago, when a job is posted, there may be, depending upon the skill, you know, maybe 20 people apply to one, you might get 100 or 150 apply to another. Um, so all of those candidates that apply are in our, in our system that we can then search for independent of a job opportunity later. So a company like K-Force that has offices throughout the country, and now we have just recruiters throughout the country, right? Because we're not going into the office. They all have access to that same talent pool through an open database and open system. So they're able to search based upon skill sets, based upon geography, uh, zip code radius, you know, all, all of those sorts of things to be able to corral um, a, a set of results. Now, what I would recommend is if you see an opportunity that you're specifically relevant in, I would apply to that opportunity again, because that kind of comes in that one channel that a recruiter is looking in looking at that becomes higher on the list because you've showed interest in a specific position. So there's always a balance, right? It's a, it's a balance of what's the right skill set, but then what's the right skill set of somebody who has already shown interest in the opportunity as well. Um, so you don't want to go, you know, applying to every single job, but if there are those roles that you're interested in, you know, it would not hurt to apply to that second opportunity as well. Now, with that being said, once you have established a relationship with a recruiter, if you see a job that's posted, I would reach out directly to that recruiter and let them know, hey, I know that you, you, you may not have gotten to this yet. I saw this was posted yesterday afternoon. Um, wanted to be able to talk to you. Why don't you give me a little bit more information about that? And I would just go directly to that source if you're, if you're building and fostering that relationship. Great. Well, we're starting to come up on time. And Adam, I, I can't thank you enough for the, the wisdom shared today. Uh, it's, it's clear that everyone can, uh, can apply this information to their pursuits um, within STEM. Um, and of course, I want to thank everybody who joined us today and for all the questions. Uh, we hope you can join us for our upcoming webinars in the STEM series. Uh, the two that we have coming up is making a power profile to ace the interview and land your dream job by one of our stars here, Aaron Zoller. And the next one following that will be simple yet surprising ways to advance your career with Sandy Marin, another one of our top performers. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, these webinars will be recorded and placed on our website. Um, we look forward to your feedback as we move forward and, and we, we will be sending you that survey and we hope to connect with you soon. Your feedback will help form our direction. Have a great day, everybody, and thanks again. Thank you, everyone.